we need to change the medical profession. And that change in the medical profession is being met with resistance. If you look at how science is progressing, it seems very slow. But if you look at the existence of human in terms of the existence of the universe, things are moving fast. Virtual humans and digital twins really mark a new generation of medicine because for the very first time, medicine will be truly predictive and truly personalized. Artificial intelligence is around for, for a very short amount of time. In medicine, we are just starting to learn how to apply these technologies. These are technologies unlike uh, any of the sort that have come before. So how do we advance technology so much without it being invasive is, is a real question. We have this great opportunity to make healthcare better. We could save tens of millions of people every year as we perfect these technologies. Well, if you say virtual humans to a regular person, they'll think that you're talking about a Hollywood special effect, you know, something that looks uh, like a human uh, and is very, very kind of detailed down to the last pore of skin. But when I'm talking about uh, virtual humans, what I'm talking about is a digital twin of a person. And that digital twin not only looks like them, or it can look like them, but critically, it behaves just like them. So if you look at maybe the most advanced digital twins we've got at the moment, they're digital twins of hearts. And those digital twins you can actually use to uh, test drugs, just to see whether they're gonna cause uh, rhythm disturbances to the heart. And in certain applications, they can give you more accurate results than animal experimentation. Today, we've got one size fits all medicine. For some people, it can cause side effects. A lot of uh, major medicines don't really work on significant numbers of people. So what we need is truly personalized medicine. So making a digital twin of an individual person gives you something to play with that will actually behave like that person. The main thing is that we are becoming less exposed to the risk of individual doctors. People can have more uniform, fair, and uh, widely available health care that can be the same for everybody. On the one side, you, you're building a uh, digital twin in, in which you're creating copies of the human body inside of a computer. And then on top of that, of course, we have decision making. And given large amount of data, we want to then drive decision making in healthcare to, to make better decisions. These two things are very different and yet use very similar uh, mathematical methods and, and uh, technologies. Well, in the Science Museum in London, we got a really beautiful example of a digital twin. It was created by an engineer at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, Yasmin Aguada Sierra. She took a, an off-the-shelf digital heart model called Alia Red. She used her own data to customize it so it beats like her heart. You can see waves of electrical activity going around her heart. You can actually see the fibers of muscle fiber contracting with each heartbeat and gives you a sense of the power and the potential of digital twin technology. The brain is the most inaccessible human organ. And uh, what the virtual brain does is it simulates what is going to happen in different other regions of the brain than the ones that we can see from the clinical picture. This has been most effectively developed uh, in uh, diagnosing and treating epilepsy. Um, there is a technique called a virtual epileptic patient based on this virtual brain approach, which allows you to identify 28% uh, more epileptogenic zones 
then would be visible from the clinical picture. If you look into the future and into the, maybe the more distant future, I can see a time when we'll have not just one digital twin of our bodies, where we in real time will be constantly sending information to our digital twin and our digital twin will be telling us what we're up to. But there could be hundreds or even thousands of digital twins. You know, rather than you experimenting on yourself, which is what we do at the moment, you know, if you try a new diet, um, you've got no insight really into whether that's the one for you. And in fact, doctors are experimenting on you, you know, in the sense that if you need an antibiotic, they say, try this one. If this doesn't work, I'll give you a stronger antibiotic. So rather than that, we can explore the possible uh, health futures of a patient through hundreds or even thousands of digital twins. We can have personalized medicine where the treatment and the solution and the response from the healthcare system can be personalized to our genome, to our healthcare uh, history, to any kind of measurements and numbers that we can extract in a uniform way from, from the body and, and the environment. So many people have been touched by disease in their family a loved one, a friend, and watch them struggle through a disease that they maybe didn't have to die or suffer from. So it's never far from my mind, like, this is crazy, why can't we figure out what people have and fix it more efficiently? What happened about three years ago is Apple and Samsung and Google put a chip that was really for augmented reality, a chip with high fidelity in the near infrared picture of you can't open your phone with the lasers bouncing off of your face and being received on this camera chip. Each of those lasers were cost $100,000 20 years ago. Now that pack of lasers is a dollar. And I thought, huh, could we actually use physics and the tools of our time, which are, of course, artificial intelligence and deep learning, but also Moore's Law and device physics and consumer electronics and there's all kinds of physics, jujitsu you can do with this, and tickling neurons or tickling stem cells or bursting cancer cells without harming any healthy tissue. The principle well known by opera singers. They pick up a wine glass, they ping it. They hear that note, oh, they replicate it, they sing loudly, the wine glass bursts, but nothing else in the room is harmed. We could treat diseases, cancers, arthritis, diabetes, blood disease, mental disease, neurodegenerative disease. It looks like we have potential with this type of technology to cure 90% of what ails us and what kills us. That totally changes everything. It's not just the steady march of Moore's law and increment. It's a step change. It's a quantum leap in what is possible with the manufacturing processes that have reached this moment. When I started as a student, uh, dreaming about an artificial hand, or an artificial leg, or a, an artificial heart, these were really science fictions, and I've seen them becoming a reality. Restoration is the first uh, challenge. Then, in doing this, uh, you may be able to even increase the performance of uh, the original limbs and sensors. So you could even think about augmenting, not just restoring, but augmenting the performance. And this could happen by developing, for example, bionic limbs. Very much interested in this. So a, a hand or an arm or a leg that is connected to the nervous system of the person so that can substitute uh, his or her lost limbs. But due to uh, our technological capabilities could even be better than the previous uh, limb. And the same with uh, senses, uh, and uh, maybe the same with brain.
My name is Jessica Smith. I'm a former Paralympian, now working as a disability inclusion consultant and children's author. I was born missing my left arm and to this day we don't know why that occurred but for the last 12 months I've been using a bionic hand. The way in which this hand works it's called myoelectric sensing. There are electrodes or sensors on the inside of this part of the forearm which are aligned to the remaining forearm muscles in my arm, my, the residual limb. I tell my brain to move and contract my muscles and as I'm doing that it sends a signal to the computer in the hand, which is programmed to different gestures and hand grips. And I can control the speed and the force with an app on my phone. Uh, and it's personalized to me. Um, and by that, I mean in terms of being able to be in control of whatever the, the grips or hand gestures are. The technology is enabling me to create new neural pathways. When I drink water from a cup, you know, the first time I did that, it was the first time. It wasn't as if I was doing it that from memory. I'm creating memories um, and new actions. Things that are as intricate as a, applying mascara, playing a game of Jenga, um, things that I've never been able to do before. You know, I'm, I'm 39 today. Um, and so it's extraordinary to know that this technology now exists and I'm so fortunate that it's in my lifetime and seeing what we have today and what the future holds, you know, I know that younger generations of people who are born or acquire a disability will be able to use technology and that level of adaption and transition will be so much smoother. And so it's extraordinary for me as a user to be able to learn how to do this, but to also be able to have the access to such advanced technology. There is fascinating research coming out of uh, the labs which addresses some of the most impenetrable uh, conditions uh, that humans can have. And one good example is the spinal cord implant developed uh, by the Polytechnic of Lausanne team and this enables uh, paralyzed people to walk again within 24 hours. Uh, this is impressive, amazing technology which is the result of uh, the work of interdisciplinary teams. There is work going on also on the visual prosthesis uh, in order to address the problem of people who have a history of vision. And this means that their visual cortex is largely intact, uh, but the retina doesn't function. So you need to replace that. You need uh, some sort of glasses to pick up the signal from outside, translate it into what the visual cortex can read, and people begin to see uh, shapes, begin to see letters. It's not yet the type of vision which um, most of us experience, uh, but it is already extremely impactful. There is a symbiosis between genetics and healthcare. Imagine once we'll be able to look at the genetics and the healthcare history of people at large when data is going to be released from the confines of a uh, doctor's notebook so that we can look at the implications of different gene sequences on different risks and different opportunities for the individual person. We'll be able to make decisions for that person or help that person make decisions for themselves in a personalized way to connect it to their genome. The building block of human is DNA. And if you look at the genome, it is a three billion base pair long string. And it, it, there's a lot of gene embedded within that string. You can see um, a piece of string that has ACGT, you know, uh, sequences that can alter. And these are called mutation. So any base that has a mutation that is damaging for our health causes a disease. So the technology that we are looking at is CRISPR that can alter the bases into the normal state. So whatever disease that is happening because of this change at the DNA level can be altered back to the normal state. And some of the genes are in the dark region of the genome, meaning that those are really extremely hard to sequence. And we have brought a technology uh, that will allow us to you know, sequence long stretches of DNA. So including those dark regions or unreachable re re regions of the genome. Arguably, our center is one of the biggest research center, genome research center in, in the inter-Middle East. So 
hopefully will bring a very novel insight for, from this region. Gene editing and cell therapy addresses the very substance of what we are made of. And it can be a one-time treatment. So gene editing, you know, it should be a treatment for lifetime. We want to cure disease with the patient's own cell. So making heart cells, brain cells, muscle cells, or what my lab is studying is pancreatic cells, the insulin producing cells that are deficient in diabetes. I believe we are ahead of a revolution in healthcare. Applying CRISPR uh, genome editing has also, uh, you know, been discussed uh, from the point of view of ethics and morals. So we talked about how it can be applicable to disease. Now we are talking about how it can be applicable to trait. Uh, first of all, we need to see, is it really necessary? Uh, do, do we need that? And how ethically, you know, viable this is. Bringing this technology to alter DNA to have trait or aesthetic features, um, is it beneficial? Having certain features of our face or our skin or our color, it's hard to set objective uh, like that because whenever you're changing a DNA based in the germinal cell, in the sperm or in the egg, that will change that particular base forever. So the whole family lineage from then on will carry that particular change. So this is the first time actually human acquired the power kind of changing ourselves forever. So that's why it's a very powerful technology for hum humanity. There's always anxiety about technologies. We're all aware of unintended consequences. So there could be what seems like a quite straightforward change to make you a superhuman and of course that in itself is quite controversial. What do we mean by normal? Where does the line change between something where you're uh, you're medically intervening and when you're actually making someone hu superhuman and so on? I just think we should try to cure disease and aging and make ourselves better and we have to define what that is. How else could I improve myself? We talk about solving diseases but how do we want to be better? And how do we want to make ourselves better? Could you imagine a world where somebody who was historically perceived to be broken and incapable and weak might become the superhumans of the next generation? I think that there is something so remarkable uh, in that and I would love to be alive when that is taking place, inshallah. But I think it depends on how society responds. So it really is up to having those important conversations, but making sure that level of awareness is um, facilitated in a way where people feel safe and part of the conversation uh, for the sake of bettering humanity. We need to involve uh, the researchers, uh, we need to involve the innovators and the users, be they patients or be they uh, no consumers. Uh, sometimes they are called the missing voices in the debate because the regulators tend to um, decide uh, among themselves uh, on how these issues should be governed, while the process has to be extremely inclusive. We also need to involve ethicists um, because ethicists ask the types of questions which nobody else would. They really um, concern the most intimate aspect of what it means to be human. I am open to using technology to further enhance my performance and to be able to um, you know, predict potential illnesses or diseases. However, I don't ever want to have two arms. I'm happy and very proud to live with a disability. So I'm fearful of using technology to perfect and correct humans. I think when you talk about you know, being able to fly and do these sorts of things is, is quite extraordinary, but I don't want people to lose sight of the importance of diversity. We can try to achieve a, you know, a perfect human body, but within that there will always be difference and at the core and foundation of every technological advancement is human.